Basic Equimistis. In this video, we're going to look at approximating the distribution of beta 1 hat. What does that mean? And why do I think it's interesting? Well, remember that we started out with the question whether beta 1 hat was a good estimator. We explored this a little bit and we've come up at least with partial answers. So we figured out that beta 1 hat is unbiased. So on average, we estimate the correct value. Well, unbiased, we are very happy to have an unbiased estimator, but still, if the variance is very large, then there's a substantial probability that we're estimating values far from the expectation and therefore far from the true value. So just, uh, just saying that we have an unbiased estimator doesn't tell us that our, all our estimates are going to be very precise. Um, so we've looked a little bit at this problem of the variance and we've done some comp uh, a bit of comparative statics for the variance. So we have now a fairly firm understanding of the things that feed into the variance that make it um, be larger or, or smaller. One of those things was the sample size. So if we increase the sample size, our estimates uh, become more and more precise. Um, and this is called consistency. Now, again, consistency is a very nice property to have, but it doesn't really address the problem that most of the time we have a fixed sample size and we're wondering for this uh, fixed sample size, let's say 50 or 100, how, um, how accurate is my estimator? For example, one thing that we might be interested in is in probabilities of bad estimates where bad estimate might be a estimate that overestimates the truth by more than one or um, underestimates the truth by more than one. So we would very much like to know or be able to calculate these kind of probabilities. But to do that, we have to know more than the expectation or the variance of the estimator. We have to characterize its whole distribution. And this is what we're going to do now. A very powerful result in statistics is called the central limit theorem. And it says that we can approximate the distribution of a lot of random variables by a normal distribution. And this turns out to also work here. If we assume that our assumptions OLS1 through OLS4 hold, I note that I didn't include OLS5, our, our homoscedasticity assumption, because it is not needed for this. If these assumptions hold, then beta1 hat will have approximately a normal distribution. I'll put just capital N for normal distribution. And a normal distribution is a probability distribution that um, is parameterized by two um, parameters corresponding to its expectation and its variance. So the expectation is then the expectation of beta one hat and the variance, the variance of beta one hat. Now note that under these assumptions, beta one hat is also unbiased. So we can just replace the expectation of beta one hat by the true beta one. Now, if we had homoscedasticity, um, had assumed homoscedasticity, then also we could replace this by, by our formula for, for the variance, right? But we don't wanna go there. Now by the rules for manip manipulating normal distributions, this in fact is equivalent to taking beta one hat, then subtracting its expectation or given unbiasedness, the true value beta one, and then dividing by its standard deviation, so the square root of its variance. And then this will be approximately a normal distribution with expectation zero and variance one. So this is called the standard normal distribution. Standard normal. So these, uh, this distribution approximation is, is an approximation. So the left-hand side and the right-hand side are not exactly equal. So the um, approximation is justified for large samples. So if the sample size n is large, then this will almost be an equality. 
Let's look at the quality of the Mount Normal approximation in our Monte Carlo simulations. Here, again, as I did before, I simulated the distribution of beta 1 hat, and it is given here by the density with, uh, that is drawn with a solid line. So, uh, this density. And here I've also drawn another density, which is the density of a normal distribution with the, uh, the, the appropriate expectation and the appropriate variance. And this density here is drawn with a dashed line, so it's given by this line. And as you can see, these two densities are almost the same, they, they almost coincide. That means the normal approximation works very well in this example. Now, the normal approximation is theoretically justified for very large samples. Here we're using it with a sample size of just n equal 50, which isn't very large. But as you can see, it's already working very well. We now want to explore what, um, how we can use this normal approximation to compute approximate probabilities. For this sort of, let me just introduce some notation. So if we have a random variable z that has a normal distribution, a standard normal distribution, then, so the probability that z um, realizes to some value smaller, um, small, smaller than little z is given by the distribution function of capital Z, right? And the distribution function of a standard normal um, random variable is denoted by capital Phi. So this is, I'm going to use this. So now we can compute probabilities. For example, we might be interested in the probability that we estimate a value that is uh, that exceeds beta 1 by one unit. So that means we, we overestimate by more than one unit. What is the probability of that happening? Well, we ha will have to rearrange this inequality to find a nicer expression. And what we're going to do is that first we'll take beta 1 to the other side. So we'll have beta 1 minus beta 1 hat minus beta 1 larger than 1 and also larger than 1 and also we are divide we are div we divide both sides of the inequality by the standard deviation of beta hat 1 so that's the square root of the variance of beta hat 1 So we know from uh, from the normal approximation result that under um, our assumptions, this will be approximately normal distribution. Right? So this will be approximately the probability that a normally distributed random variable, so let's call it z, is larger than 1 over standard deviation of beta hat 1. And now this we can rewrite, uh, rewrite as 1 minus the probability that z is smaller than this. And now here, this is just um, the distribution function of capital Z evaluated at this number. So if we knew the standard deviation, um, we could now compute this probability. Now we are going to talk about the standard error of beta 1 hat. What's the standard error? Well, remember the standard deviation of beta 1 hat that we needed in our calculation, but so, so didn't know, right? The standard deviation is something that typically we do not know. But maybe we can estimate it. Uh, 
and an estimator of the standard deviation. So in our notation, our first instinct is obviously to just call it S D hat, right? This would be co confirmed to the notation we use elsewhere, but it just so happens for some historical reasons that an estimator of a standard deviation is called a standard error. So we call the estimator of the standard deviation standard error or SE of beta hat one. It's called the standard error of beta hat one. So how do you um, construct such an um, estimator of a standard deviation? Well, the idea is you first try to come up with an estimator um, of the variance, and then you just take the square root. And how do you get an estimator of the variance? Well, we have a we might have a formula for the variance, right? We certainly did have a formula for the variance of beta hat one in the case um, of um, homoscedastic errors. So you take this formula. Now it will um, contain a lot of stuff that you do not know. For example, it might contain the variance of x1, right? So we had the variance of x1 showed up uh, in our formula under if, under the homoscedasticity assumption. So since we don't know the variance of x1, for example, we also don't know the, the variance of beta 1 hat, right? But so the idea is that we apply the method of moments. So we look at the, this formula and then we replace all the population quantities by their sample analogs. For example, we would replace the variance the population variance by the ensemble variance. So we just put hats on everything, right? So this would be a method of moments approach. And then we will get an estimator of the variance that we can then take the square root of and then we have an estimator of a standard deviation or a standard error. How well our standard error works will depend a lot on the formula for the variance that we use here. So we might derive a formula for the variance under different assumptions. A standard error that is derived under the assumption of heteroscedastic errors is called a robust standard error. And robust in the sense that it is robust to heteroscedasticity. Now, one thing that students often get confused about is that they think if you ha have um, a heteroscedastic error, then you can't have a homoscedastic error. That's actually not true. Well, heteroscedasticity just means you're not assuming all S5. So you're not assuming that all S5 is true, but you're also not assuming that it is false, right? You just make one less assumption. So heteroscedastic errors are more general. So if you tell Stata to compute a robust standard error, and you can do that, then Stata will not assume all S5, will derive some um, standard error that is generally uh, valid, no matter whether all S5 holds or not. So this is what you usually want to do because it's just safer. It will always, it will, it's guaranteed to work regardless of whether assumption OS5 holds or does not hold. We've already encountered the following normal approximation result that if we take beta hat one minus the true value beta one and divide by the standard deviation, and we have approximately a norm, standard normal distribution. And we used this approximation result before to compute a probability and the problem was we couldn't quite get rid of the standard deviation and showed up in our you know, final calculation. Um, so, and we, it's a number, the standard, the standard deviation is a number that we do not know. But um, we might be able to estimate it using a standard error, right? So we re just replace the standard deviation by the standard error. And in doing so, we obviously we we replacing a, the true value 
by something that estimates the true value, but is random. So we introduce additional randomness in the denominator. And it turns out that if our um, standard error is sensibly constructed, which we can most of the time assume that it is, then we can ignore this additional randomness. So the um, this fraction with the random denominator is approximately equal to the fraction where we divide by the true standard deviation. And in terms of if we can ignore the middle, middle part, we can just approximate this quantity by a standard normal. Using this new result, we can go back to this calculation. And so here we wanted to compute the probability that we estimate that we're overestimating the true beta one by one unit. And we sort of used our normal approximation and we came up with this formula, which had one unknown, uh, the standard deviation. And um, yeah, so the, I promised that we would fix it and we do that right now. So what we do, in, um, we would have to take a slightly different approach. Um, what we would do here is still we take beta one to the left hand side, that's fine. But then we divide by the standard error instead of the standard deviation. So we put uh, we plug in an estimate of the standard deviation. Um, then we know this is um, st still behaves like a normal random variable capital Z. So we can um, the left hand side doesn't change from what we had before. But then this here also will have to be the standard error. Uh, the same here. And then also here we have the standard error. Now, what do we have? Um, here it says to compute this probability, take the standard error, right? The standard error is something that we can compute um, given data. So this is a number that we, we have. And then just evaluate the normal um, distribution function at then this number. Also, we know how to um, evaluate the normal distribution function. We um, The distribution function of a standard normal. Uh, we can do that uh, using a computer. We can do that in SATA, for example. And so we are able now to compute this formula. And so we are able to compute this probability.